Are you ignorant, O Asclepios, that Egypt is the image of heaven? Our land is the temple of the world. But a time will come when Egyptians will seem to have served the divinity in vain. The country that was more pious than all countries will become impious. No longer will it be full of temples, but it will be full of tombs. Neither will it be full of gods, but it will be full of corpses. O oh, river, you will flow with blood more than water, and he who is dead will not be mourned as much as he who is alive. O oh, Egypt. In the temples of Egypt, the symbols of mystical religion still stand. The ruins of the pharaoh's great kingdoms and their wealth are the headstones which mark the grave of a great civilization. When Christianity came to Egypt, the land of Copts, pagan rituals still survived. In the clash of cultures and religions, the Gnostic tradition of salvation by spiritual awareness grew up in Egypt and throughout the Roman Empire. Its message was suppressed and excised from consciousness, yet it survived. As books, the Gnostic ideas of the first centuries AD were preserved and in two separate and extraordinary cases finally brought to the attention of later generations. The Nag Hammadi Codices, discovered in 1945, are Gnostic Christian scriptures which shed much new light on the early history of the Christian Church and the Bible. The Corpus Hermeticum, a collection of Gnostic philosophical texts originally from Alexandria, arrived in Florence in 1460 and introduced new spiritual thinking to the intellectual energy of the Renaissance. One text was found in both collections, Asclepios, named after a pupil of the ancient spiritual sage and philosopher, Hermes Trismegistus. A great miracle, O Asclepios, is man. Honor and reverence to such a being, because he takes in the nature of a god as if he were himself a god. He has familiarity with the demon kind, knowing that he issues from the same origin. He despises this part of his nature, which is but human, because he puts his hope in the divinity of the other part. Oh, what a privileged blend makes up the nature of man. He takes the earth as his own. He blends himself with the elements by the speed of his thought. Everything is accessible to him. Heaven is not too high for him, for he measures it as if it were in his grasp by his ingenuity. What sight the spirit shows to him, no mist of the air can obscure. The earth is never so dense as to impede his work. The immensity of the sea's depths do not trouble his plunging view. He is at the same time everything as he is everywhere. The Renaissance, founded upon the artistic and material wealth of Florence, enjoyed an intellectual climate highly favorable to Gnostic influence. Scholars and artists like Leonardo da Vinci and Sandro Botticelli 
under the patronage of the ruler princes of the Medici clan, excelled in art, science, exploration, philosophy, and religious thought. They sought truth, spiritual and material, through a bold new emphasis on man's own powers, in contrast to those dogmas which expressed suspicion of human aspirations which were not controlled by the Catholic Church. Gnosticism took root in Florence 500 years ago with the arrival of a volume of Greek copies of 2nd and 3rd century manuscripts, non-Christian Gnostic texts from Egypt and the Orient. This book was the Corpus Hermeticum, or Works of Hermes. The name of Hermes, trust me, because this is connected with the Greek god Hermes, Mercurius in Latin. But there's a, quite, there's a great difference. This Hermes is a kind of incarnation uh, which bears the same name, but uh, who has a great and quite other background. Well, they thought he was um, an ancient Egyptian sage and somebody who was either a predecessor or a contemporary of Moses. Um, in fact, I think it says on the Pavimento in, in, in Siena, the Cathedral at Siena, that he was actually a contemporary of Moses. Um, and in this way, he handed over um, uh, the ancient Egyptian wisdom to Moses. We cannot mention a uh, concrete person being the author of the so-called Corpus Hermeticum. We can only say that the actual writings were written in the second or third century in Alexandria by a group of scholars interested in uh, Platonic and Gnostic studies. Dr. Franz Janssen is curator of a private Dutch library, the world's largest collection of books and manuscripts of Hermetic philosophy, Gnosticism, alchemy and Rosicrucianism. The first edition of the Corpus Hermeticum is one of its most valuable volumes. Here in my hand, I have a very rare book. It is the first Latin translation of the works of Hermes, which we call now the Corpus Hermeticum, printed in the year 1471. On May the 29th, uh, 1453, the medieval world came to an end when the Turks overthrew the Byzantine Empire and a lot of Greek monasteries were overthrown and all their libraries were destroyed. And the uh, Renaissance princes, being men of very questing minds, um, bought up a lot of the manuscripts that were coming from Greece. It was about the year 1460. A monk came up to Florence, and the monk was well aware that in Florence the ruler, Cosimo de' Medici, was a book collector. And he offered him this Greek manuscript, which contains the works of Hermes. And Cosimo was immediately alert. He was more over 70 years old, and so he said to Ficino, I know you have other work to do. That other work was the translation of Plato. But this is more important. And I feel that I will die soon, and I want to read first Hermes. It's a very large body of text. Some of them are philosophical, but some of them deal with the occult. Uh, they deal with astrology. Um, they deal with what one scholar has called low-grade hocus-pocus. It does have the uh, principle of revelation, for example, um, and this, this revelation is designed uh, to reveal the nature of the cosmos and, and to, to establish man's relationship within that scheme of things. It has been described as either a semi-gnostic or hermetic gnosis. The rediscovery of ancient wisdom in 15th century Florence was due to its ruling dynasty, the Medicis. The family were patrons of the greatest artists and scholars of the New Age, who buried medieval thinking by placing man's imagination and intellect at the heart of the Renaissance. Brunelleschi's dome for the Duomo, 
expressed what Leonardo called the eternal truths of geometry. Michelangelo's David is the ultimate expression of the human form. Pico della Mirandola's oration on the dignity of man asserts the new spirit of the age. If you're content with the physical world as it is, um, and content to believe what the church tells you to believe, and I, I'm not criticizing that, but Renaissance man didn't feel this was enough somehow. And there was this sudden burst in the human spirit to investigate, to find out where man really stands in the universe as a whole. Because the, the medieval and pre-medieval view was that man was one of God's creatures and he just had to obey and worship and get on with life. Whereas the Renaissance view, um, which had its seed in the Hermetic texts, was that man, as well as being a creature of God, was also a very special creature and indeed um, could be regarded as almost equal to God. Um, and, and this, of course, uh, led in some cases to accusations of heresy. Cosimo's grandson, Lorenzo, ruled Florence in turn, maintaining the family's patronage of the artistic and intellectual genius of the age. Lorenzo was known simply as the Magnificent. Lorenzo was a phenomenal combination of a shrewd, wily, and sometimes ruthless politician. Uh, the American equivalent would be a political boss. But can one imagine a political boss in the United States who uh, had among his intimate friends uh, philosophers, uh, theologians, uh, a political boss who wrote some of the most extraordinary love poetry of the, of the Renaissance, uh, created around him a what might be called a brain trust of extraordinary figures like Marsilio Ficino, the Platonist, and Pico della Mirandola, of course. Let a certain holy ambition invade our soul. So the favored poets, scientists, artists, and philosophers enjoyed the hospitality of the Medici family in their fortress palace in the city and in the gardens of their villas on the Tuscan hills above Florence. Every year, Plato's birthday was honored at their first country house, the Villa Careggi. The central ideas of hermetism took hold in this charmed circle, which took them to be a kind of pure and original theology, prophetic of Christian teaching. Ficino, the translator of Hermes and doctor to the Medici family, attempted to practice the ideas which he found in the Corpus Hermeticum. Now, Marsilio Ficino had developed the hermetic ideas into his medical practice in so far that um, he studied the stars, as did uh, most doctors of the time. And if um, he felt that certain planets were in an unfortunate position in someone's horoscope and were causing them uh, problems of one kind or another, he endeavored to correct this by putting up images and lights in certain patterns and he composed uh, symbolic hymns and um, pursued what he called natural magic. Magic was the technique to attain hermetic gnosis. A magus was its exponent. Lorenzo was portrayed by Botticelli as one of the three magi who came to Christ's birthplace because they had the wisdom to interpret astrology. The ambition of Renaissance man to comprehend himself, the world, and God was all contained in the one word, magic. It derives, I think, from the Persian magi, who are, of course, found in the Bible as the, the three magi, who, by their knowledge and study of the stars, uh, knew that a special cosmic event was happening 
at a particular place at a particular time and went there and did something about it. And so the term Magi, and from that how they did it, magic, was quite important and quite respectable. But if this was extended to trying to operate upon the angels, um, you were in poaching on the church's preserve. There were all kinds of blasphemous uh, heresies which could be imputed to this. One of the philosophers who fell foul of the church, despite the patronage and protection of Lorenzo, was Pico della Mirandola. He spent many days of contemplation, prayer and study in the convent of San Marco, a short walk away from the Palazzo Medici in the heart of the city. Dying at only 31, he was buried in Dominican robes in the church next door. Pico was um, one of the great uh, humanists of the Renaissance. He was born in 1462 um, and uh, was obviously a child prodigy. In fact, there is a story uh, surrounding uh, his birth, and that's uh, when his mother was giving birth to him, a circle of flame appeared over, over, the, over the bed. His full name is uh, Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, Conte di Concordia. Uh, he was born into an aristocratic family. Um, had all the social and political advantages that anyone could, could wish to have uh, and was also an immensely learned uh, person. At the age of 14 he went to Bologna, studied canon law um, and gave that up because he'd sort of more or less exhausted it. This is that friendship. What he wanted to do, his enormous reading, and it was colossal, uh, was to, um, to, to bring together um, all of, uh, let's say, uh, pagan philosophy, Greek philosophy, Plato and Aristotle and so on, uh, and weld it together with Christianity in such a way um, that he would um, make Christianity fit in, as it were, to that tradition, or at least make the pagan philosophers fit in. They, they were no longer outsiders outside of, the, uh, outside of Christianity. They would simply belong together. Pico was only 24 when in 1486 he wrote a thesis of 902 theological propositions for debate with any intellectual jouster in Christendom. But a papal committee was set up to investigate a sample of 13 points. Three were condemned as heresy, the other 10 as potential heresy. The work was banned and Pico fled to France. His introduction, known as the Oration on the Dignity of Man, argued man's divinity the centerpiece of Renaissance philosophy. It attempts to locate man within the scheme of things. Um, and I think even for the standard of its time, possibly, Pico had gone um, over the top, perhaps, because he tended to not only place man at the center of God's creation, uh, but he made man a completely, as it were, independent being. Man had free choice over everything he did. He could, as it were, control his own destiny. At last, it seems to me, but I've come to understand why man is the most fortunate of creatures and consequently worthy of all admiration. And what precisely is that rank which is his lot in the universal chain of being? The essential text of the oration is a quotation from Asclepios, found at Nag Hammadi and in the Corpus Hermeticum. There is nothing to be seen more wonderful than man. In agreement with this opinion is the saying of Hermes Trismegistus, a great miracle, Asclepios, is man. Honor and reverence to such a being, because he takes in the nature of a god as if he were himself a god. Hermes, and later Pico, rejected the Christian tenet that man was God's creature. To say he was divine was blasphemous and heretical, but it was the central evidence of the spiritual shift from the medieval age to the modern era. He's saying really that man is, man is the, the culmination, man is the sort of jewel and the crown of nature, and, and all nature is subservient to man. Um, it's there for him to use and to do exactly what he likes with. Renaissance philosophers renewed man's perennial attempts to locate himself within the universe and not merely to accept his destiny as random. It is this which makes the Renaissance 
the third significant historical instance of Gnosticism. For Gnostics, man is God on Earth, and also for Pico, that's become true in the oration. Gnosis has always been judged a heresy. To the Church, Pico and the Hermetic philosophers are as heretical as the authors and readers of the Gnostic papyrus scriptures found in Egypt in 1945. Pico attempted to integrate all previous wisdom, Plato and Pythagoras, Zoroaster and Jewish Kabbalah, to confirm and fortify the Christian tradition. Not for nothing is he called the Conte di Concordia, and it's very important because Pico took things like this very seriously. The whole business of uh, gathering things together and providing a concord in which you would have a, a whole uh, was, was quite important to him, uh, and indeed to, 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 to much of the Renaissance tradition. Plato writes that of all the theoretical sciences and liberal arts, the science of computation is the chief and the most divine. Likewise inquiring, why is man the wisest of animals? The importance of the oration is it is really an affirmation of the dignity of man. The dignity resides, his own actions will determine his own eventual outcome. Together with this was the great optimism and uh, uh, which is expressed in Pico, man's power to do anything. The essence of hermetic philosophy is Gnostic. Man is free to move up or down on the great chain of being because he has nous, the divine spark of mind. Reaching nous is gnosis. The aim of the hermetist is to unite the above and the below, the inner and the outer, the known and unknown, the material and the spiritual, and to use his powers. What distinguishes him from the animals and from the rest of the creation is his own divine spark, which, if he develops or develops the knowledge of how to approach that spark, can become as God can, in fact, change the world as indeed he has since Renaissance times. Thou shalt have the power to degenerate into the lower forms of life which are brutish. Thou shalt have the power out of thy soul's judgment to be reborn into the higher forms which are divine. The Hermetic philosopher departs from the conception that there was in former ages a unity between God and man, and this unity is lost. And what the philosophy aims at is to recover this unity. This is that peace which God creates in his heavens, which the angels descending to earth proclaim to men of good will, that through it men might ascend to heaven and become angels. Contemplation of nature, looking to nature, not with, only with scientific eyes, but through nature, getting the idea behind nature. Whatever seeds each man cultivates will grow to maturity and bear in him their own fruit. If they be vegetative, it will be like a plant. In the, the oration, you have a beautifully eloquent, spelled out statement of the intermediary position of man. Man consists of uh, higher and lower uh, uh, potential, potentialities. He's set midway, a little lower than the angels. He loves to uh, quote from the Psalms there. A little lower than the angels, uh, a little higher than the beasts. Uh, where he will go, whether he rises to rejoin the one, the uh, source of all being, God, or whether he descends, and not into a Dante-esque hell, but descends to a kind of state of material brutishness, depends on his own will. 
The erosion is, is, uh, has been described by Eugenio Gardin, the great Italian Renaissance scholar, um, as the manifesto of the Renaissance. I have read in the records of the Arabians, Reverend Fathers, that Abdallah the Saracen, when questioned as to what on this stage of the world, as it were, could be seen to be most worthy of wonder, replied, there is nothing to be seen more wonderful than man. An agreement with this opinion is the saying of Hermes Trismegistus, a great miracle, Asclepius, is man. At last, it seems to me, I have come to understand why man is the most fortunate of creatures and consequently worthy of all admiration and what precisely is that rank, which is his lot in the universal chain of being, a rank to be envied not only by brutes but even by the stars and by minds beyond this world. The best of artisans, the creative powers, addressed man thus. The nature of all other beings is limited and constrained within the bounds of laws prescribed by us. Thou, constrained by no limits, in accordance with thine own free will, in whose hand we have placed thee, thou shalt ordain for thyself the limits of thy nature. Thou shalt have the power to degenerate into the lower forms of life, which are brutish. Thou shalt have the power, out of thy soul's judgment, to be reborn into the higher forms, which are divine. Whatever seeds each man cultivates will grow to maturity and bear in him their own fruit. If they be vegetative, he will be like a plant. If of the senses, he will become brutish. If intellectual, he will become an angel and the son of God. If rational, he will grow into a heavenly being. And if happy in the lot of no created thing, he withdraws into the center of his own unity, his spirit, made one with God, in the solitary darkness of God who is set above all things, he shall surpass them all. So let a certain holy ambition invade our souls, so that, not content with the mediocre, we shall pant after the highest, and since we may, if we wish, toil with all our strength to obtain it, full of divine power, we shall no longer be ourselves, but shall become he himself who made us. For he who knows himself in himself knows all things, as Zoroaster first wrote. I have also proposed theorems dealing with magic in which I have indicated that magic has two forms, one of which depends entirely on the work and authority of demons, a thing to be abhorred, so help me the God of truth, and a monstrous thing. The other, when it is rightly pursued, is nothing else than the utter perfection of natural philosophy. The former can claim for itself the name of neither art nor science, while the latter, abounding in the loftiest mysteries, embraces the deepest contemplation of the most secret things, and at last, the knowledge of all nature. As the farmer weds his vines to elms, so does the magus wed earth to heaven. That is, he weds the lower things to the endowments and powers of higher things. If all of this appears new and strange to you, Reverend Fathers, think on how the sphinxes carved into the temples of the Egyptians, reminded them that the mystic doctrine should be kept inviolable from the common herd by means of the knots of riddles. The theologian, Oregon, asserts that Jesus Christ, the teacher of life, made many revelations to his disciples which they were unwilling to write down lest they become commonplaces to the rabble. This is in the highest degree confirmed by Dionysius the Areopagite, who says that the occult mysteries were conveyed by the founders of religion from mind to mind, without writing, through the medium of speech. Let us consult the Apostle Paul, the chosen vessel, when he himself was exalted to the third heaven. 
he will answer, according to the secret interpretations of Dionysius, that he saw the cherubim being purified, then being illuminated, and at last being made perfect. When we have been so soothingly called, so kindly urged, we shall with winged feet fly up like earthly mercuries to the embraces of our blessed mother and enjoy that wished-for peace, most holy peace, indivisible bond in one accord with the friendship through which all rational souls not only shall come into harmony with the one mind which is above all minds, but shall in some ineffable way become all together one. <laughs> this is that peace which God creates in his heavens, which angels descending to earth proclaim to men of goodwill that through it men might ascend to heaven and become angels. Let us wish this peace for our friends, for our century. <laughs> PTR 0367, Gnostics program number 3, part 2, take 1. 10 seconds. Pico's optimism was ill-founded. His oration, the manifesto of the Renaissance, was never heard in public. He and his fellow hermetists pursued their philosophy and their magic, courting danger. The church, to which they were loyal, silenced them and even burned some as heretics. For the third time in 1,200 years, Gnostics were suppressed. but the Gnostic pulse continued to beat, not as a distinct form of religious practice, but as a spiritual dimension of scholarship, art, and philosophy. Hermetism and Gnosis, united in magic, remained controversial. In England, attacks on witchcraft expressed the superstitious fear that Magi had secret powers to effect spiritual changes in the cosmos. The targets 
were the celebrated Renaissance men whose scholarship knew almost no bounds, like the English scholar, linguist, inventor and magician, John Dee. Dee was a hundred years on from the Medici's Renaissance man, second generation, so to speak, um, who really could operate. He was a great mathematician. He um, was a, um, he, attended, he went to Cambridge and then to uh, the University of Louvain and at the age of 23 uh, gave mathematical discourses at the University of Paris uh, which were so popular that people were standing in the windows. He was a very brilliant man of his times. Um, he lived uh, and they all lived in a very different world. They really believed in an inner world of spirits and that these spirits could affect man um, and just as man could affect the world. The most famous magician of Dee's era is in the work of Shakespeare. The figure of Prospero may represent a disguised defense of the real scholars and magicians of the time, discredited in a climate of fear and superstition. The Tempest is one of Shakespeare's last plays and therefore is written in the time of James because James was very much obsessed with witchcraft and demonology. So if Shakespeare was presenting Dee as Prospero, he was in some way trying to reinstate Dee or reinstate the image of the Hermetic philosopher. Ye elves of hills, brook standing lakes and groves and you that are on the sands with printless foot to chase the ebbing Neptune and to fly him when he comes back you demi puppets that by moonshine to the sour green ringlets make whereof the you not bite and whose delight it is to make midnight mushrooms that rejoice to hear the solemn curfew by whose aid weak masters though ye be I have bedimmed the noontide sun brought forth the mutinous winds and twixt the green sea and the azure vault set roaring war To the dread rattling thunder have I given fire and rifted Jove's stout oak with his own bolt. The strong base promontory have I made shake and by the spurs plucked up the pine and cedar. Graves at my command have waked their sleep Oped and let them forth by my so potent art. The Magus Prospero summoned up a tempest, but his magic powers can unite and pacify restoring harmony where worldly conflict has poisoned human relationship. But this rough magic I here abjure, but when I have required some heavenly music, which even now I do to work mine end upon the senses that this airy charm is for, I'll break my scarf Bury it certain fathoms in the earth, and deeper than it ever plummet sound, I'll drown my book. Prospero, perhaps based on Dr. D, discards his magic. Whether because of its dangers or because harmony and hermetic gnosis have been achieved remains ambiguous. 
Our revels now are ended. And the actors, as I foretold, only spirits and are melted into air, into thin air, which, like the baseless fabric of the vision, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, yea, all that it inherit, shall dissolve, and like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. Since the fading of the Renaissance, open manifestations of Gnosticism have been rare and intermittent. Its exponents have been scattered. Yet through almost five centuries of art, literature and philosophy, the inward pulse of Gnosis has endured, despite its inherent conflict with church dogmas and rationalist principles. Gnosis underlies alchemy and rejected the age of reason, yet found exponents in the Romantic era. The 16th century German shoemaker mystic Jakob Burma is claimed by some as a Gnostic, as is another German, the poet Goethe, who immortalized the magical legend of Faust. Advocates of the Gnostic tradition argue for the Gnostic inspiration of names as diverse as William Blake, Karl Marx, Rudolf Steiner, Carl Jung, and John Lennon. According to the Dutch scholar, Professor Gillis Quispel, Gnosis has endured since the Renaissance as one of the three central pillars of European thought and spirituality. Gnosis is the third element in the cultural pattern of Europe. It has always been there in antiquity, in the Middle Ages, and in modern times. Besides reason, and besides the faith, there has always been the awareness that imaginative thinking can be true and that the heart has its reasons, which reason doesn't know. Gareth Knight, who has studied hermetism and magic throughout history, believes that hermetic gnosis will survive as a spiritual liberation from the rational world. It's liberating from the trammels of too narrow a vision, it's liberation from a materialistic vision which is causing us to rape the earth of its resources in a scramble for goods uh, which we don't know how to deal with because still millions starve in spite of all our technology. And um, the hermetic view is that we need to Look a little wider. The drive of life in itself always comes from an invisible spiritual level and I believe that the technical world they discovered the secret of the atom in businessman who runs both his life and his company on the principles of hermetism the concrete achievement of his materialistic vision is balanced by life's spiritual dimension a human being can go in the same moment spiritual and material if he is really connected to his own inner center that is linked with the center of the universe. Rick 
Goodman's company, De Ster Corporation, is one of the world's three largest producers of plastics for in-flight airline catering. The highly automated Belgian factory produces 20 million individual items each day for delivery to airline kitchens around the world. The factory shows for me the meaning of communication, that you are a human being who serves the problems of the four corners of the world. I believe that I can be very proud with 600 million articles around me, serving 350 million people all, all over the world, and be in a daily contact with 250 airlines. The inner connection between this factory and my library is the absolute possibility for a human being to deal with an impulse in a spiritual aspect and in a material aspect. And I can say, I achieved with my library, who was a main part in my life, I achieved to be in a contact with the spiritual influence of the past, of the Gnostics, you can say, but also the spirituality of today, but even now, the spirituality of the future. Rittman's private life and his personal wealth have for 20 years been devoted to building this library, the Bibliotheca Philosophica Hermetica in Amsterdam. The world's largest private collection of Gnostic, Hermetic and related manuscripts and first editions. The separate parts of his life form a philosophical whole. If you look to it in a superficial way, it looks a contradiction, matter and spirit. But it isn't. I see my library as the library of the light. And the best thing is to communicate, is to communicate in the light. The writers of my library are well together in the library, in the same communication, the same principle of uh, their absolute relation to that inner impulse. Pico's oration on the dignity of man, with its emphasis on man's spiritual and material powers in unison, is Rittman's text for life. Pico put the human the commitment to hermetism imbues his company philosophy. His aim is to pass on from the practicalities of business to make contact with a neglected inner dimension of human relationship. There are two ways where you can prove people that there is a value in life. And with the Stair Company, I brought the company to a very successful level as I solved the problems of my customers. It is in a way the same as in the spiritual aspect. I think that with my library, with the spiritual value that I created through the wells uh, of my business life, I brought the same value, but not as a material product, but you can say it as a spiritual product. No one working for Rittman's company can fail to observe the influence of the hermetic tradition. Between the chairman's executive suite and the corporate offices, there stands a specially commissioned temple to Hermes in marble and bronze. You see here, God is an infinite sphere whose center is everywhere and his circumference nowhere. So, to give an answer to the question of man, I like to refer to Pico de la Mirandola, who says, Magnum Miraculum Homo Est. A great miracle, Asclepius, is man. A great miracle, Asclepius, is man.
Oostritman's plastics empire is not alone in uniting modern high-tech industry with a Gnostic spiritual vision. In America's Silicon Valley, there has existed for 10 years a small but thriving Gnostic church, which uses scriptures based on the texts from Nag Hammadi and is led by a woman bishop. Today, the knowledge of the Gnostics is a self-knowledge. The last program of this series will show that in the modern era, which began with the Renaissance and the dignity of man, the pulse of Gnosis beats still, yet remains a mystery.